Okay, thanks for the intro. Um, welcome everyone to the second day. Look, I'm John. I'm going to do a presentation today that I really hope you enjoy and it's all about creating impact as a medical student and transitioning towards being a junior doctor. So in 1931, Daisy Catterbell was eight years old. She undertook a journey of extreme significance. As a mixed race child, she was outcast from her family and taken from the Jigalong community to Mugumba Mission, not far from where we are today. With her cousin sisters, Molly and Grace, they walked 1,600 kilometres over eight weeks, evading capture, sleeping in ditches to eventually make it home. This journey is extremely significant for Western Australia and it was encapsulated in the film Rabbit Proof Fence. Sadly, in March, on the 30th of March, Daisy died. She was an aged care resident in the hospital, which I'm a proud senior doctor in Port Hedland. And this is her last year telling her stories to the staff and the other people of our community and inspiring us. Daisy walked towards the problem. She walked towards her future. And I want you to put yourself in her shoes and ask, would you do the same thing if you were in her situation? For everyone who's traveled here today, welcome to the wild, wild west. Although it might not quite look like this at the moment, normally the sun sets over the ocean. We're a little confused. We've got flowers with red stems and, and green flowers. We've got a brilliant AFL stadium. We don't know how to use one of these. We've got amazing new hospitals and the west coast of Australia is really where we have a culture of innovation born from geographic isolation. I was actually part of the uh, 2006 AMSA convention committee and I know there's been a convention since then, but it's really great to be back here today. And I, I want you to look at the calibre of the speakers that Harry, um, Jesse and your academic committee have managed to achieve because they are some absolutely fantastic doctors and I want you to go to as many sessions as you can. This morning I'm going to talk about my narrative with you. I'm going to take you on a journey up to the northern half of our state, for those of you who haven't been there, and I'm going to, going to provide you with five key lessons on how you can make impact over the next few years. And I really hope that you, like me, can find your life of medicine rewarding and fulfilling. From the earliest age I can remember, I wanted to give back to other people. When I was five years old, I opened a rock museum um, and it was highlighting all these beautiful rocks, various shades of brown from camping trips across Western Australia. I got all my friends and my family and they came and they were smiling and from that moment forwards I knew that I loved being involved with other people. I went through my education and I went to UWA and I started doing medical school here in Perth. And it was at medical school that I suffered from two terrible afflictions. The first one was that I loved everything in life except for studying. So I loved you know, working in retail, I loved going out with my friends, and I loved all the beautiful opportunities that my parents who were teachers and academics had created for me. And the second affliction was that I, uh, I was an extrovert and I became extremely overcommitted and terribly tired through medical school. I went through um, at lightning speed, it was almost like I was running a marathon, I was spending my summer vacation teaching fitness classes and volunteering abroad. Um, I was collecting a rich tapestry of life experiences like I think we've seen from the morning show you guys have been doing over the past few days. Um, and I started the Red Party HIV fundraiser a few years ago as well, which I understand still happens through quite a few med societies. I also learned about failure in 2003, studying for my third year pathology exams. I obviously didn't study hard enough and I, and I failed one of my exams and I was crushed. But I didn't learn my lesson and I continued on to work with AMSA and IFMSA for the rest of my medical student career. For me, medical school was an endurance sport. Um, at this point, look, I really hadn't learned a lot about myself. I had a limited range of emotional connections to life. Um, and I think part of my subconsciousness must have realised this because at the end of medical school, when I was going to select my intern applications, I deliberately put Port Hedland Rural Emergency Medicine as my first preference. But the funny thing was, even though I'd got so many experiences being a student and travelled all over the world, it wasn't until I was in Port Hedland that I began to develop empathy. One day in the ED, I was treating a patient who was 18 years old. 
Now this patient had obesity hyperventilation syndrome, so he had so much adipose tissue that gas exchange was impaired and he couldn't stay awake. So with one hand, I had a CPAP mask and we were sealing that over his face. And then I looked out the ambulance bay door and I saw a child who was maybe eight years old, so you know, 10 years his junior. And this child was kicking rubbish around the forecourt of the hospital. And there was this incredible parallel where I was thinking, what has happened in this patient's life in the 10 years from being an eight-year-old to an 18-year-old that have led him to become like this? What are the lifestyle decisions that he's made that have led him to become so unhealthy? And me, as a doctor, only five years his senior, was standing there in a seemingly healthy environment. And I felt ashamed. For the first time in my life, I felt ashamed to be Australian. And I thought, we've got to do something about this. So I phoned up three friends and I said, come on an adventure with me. A few years earlier, I had the idea to recycle sports equipment. And I wanted to take recycled sports equipment and give it to that eight-year-old boy so that he wouldn't become the 18-year-old man. My friends said yes. We started this adventure, which you can see here, and we, there was generous donors from all across Perth. We set up some bright blue collection bins, and then essentially we drove from Albany to Kununurra, which if you're not from WA, is a long way. It's 3,000 k's. <laughs> we passed the donations on as we went. We didn't have insurance. We didn't really have a strategy. We had all these dumbbells in the back of a four-wheel drive and it was quite dangerous. But the one thing we did have was a mission and that was to ensure that that eight-year-old would not become that 18-year-old. So we'd begun using dusty, worthless items with sports equipment in people's garages to transform people's lives. And we named our charity Fair Game. Um, I just thought, wouldn't it be great if we could use recycled footballs as the tools for healthier community change. So our colleagues got involved and we started adding a bit of structure to the sessions. Um, we started incorporating best practice health messages into games. So for example, you might find some of our volunteers here today, um, but you might find some of them on the fair game trips in between footy games, running with Mr. Chompers, who's our big pair of teeth here, and just reinforcing to kids you know, how to brush their teeth and the importance of oral hygiene. You might find them sitting under a tree at halftime in a sports game with one of these really cool bags. They've got these big um, you know, bags where you can put goo on footballs that glows in the dark when the kids put their hands inside. So you play a game of football and then the kids come put their hands and they see all the germs and you say, look, this is what gastroenteritis is caused by. So let's talk about the importance of hand washing before we go and eat our oranges. But as more and more donations became pouring in, we started partnering with other organisations, but more importantly, we started partnering with the participants. We started asking communities, you know, what do you want and what can we learn from you? We've now set up some fantastic programs and one of which is called the Wellness Walkabout. This is Australia's first Aboriginal yoga program. So it's dream time stories about children going walkabout and seeing animals along their journey. And when they see the animals, they do the yoga poses. So I could invite some fair gamers up here to do some of them, but I won't. Um, so you can imagine there's kangaroo, there's emu, but not only are these poses encouraging core strength and physical flexibility, they also make the link between fitness, culture and language. So they're reinforcing some highly endangered Aboriginal languages. Some of these languages actually only have 30 speakers. And Fair Game takes this program out and we've done some research and we're doing some more research this year, hopefully, Jordan, and it's looking at the, uh, the impact it has on the social and emotional well-being of these children. And we found that it improves mood disorder and conduct disorders. Every 12 weeks, we've got busy bees and all our Fair Gamers come together and we pack up recycled equipment to take it to places like this. To date, we've recycled about 35,000 items of sports equipment. Now, if we were to take those items and put them in, on this stage, they would probably fill the entire stage. It's hundreds of cubic metres of sports equipment, but I don't just think about it as 35,000 items, 35, items of equipment. I think about it as 35,000 opportunities for people to engage in their community. 35,000 opportunities for people to, to participate in sport that they normally wouldn't have. 35,000 opportunities to reduce cholesterol, you know, improve glomerular filtration and stop those chronic diseases. We had 56 wish list item, 56 items with 3,000 wish lists last term. Now, if you think about it, that means that there's so many sports teams, schools, rec clubs that are existing and that can't afford funding and they're existing because of fair game. And 
as the chair of the organisation, you know, in medical school, we're not talk about how, taught about how to run a business. I've had to learn about strategy, marketing, running a charity, um, hiring staff, dealing with crises. And then in 2015, we started to think big and we started establishing hubs outside WA. We've got a small hub in Sydney and there are some med students and some other students helping us there. And we have a small hub in Armidale, New South Wales. And I don't know if any of our fair gamers, we have a little bit of a few fair gamers representing at the back here from Armidale um, as well. So we've now got a CEO and every year we, we inspire over 3,000 people. And we make the equivalent time donation to Australian communities of over $250,000 per year. We have a little over 200 fair gamers and every single one of them is special to me and special to our charity. And ultimately, we'd love these programs to become community-led and responsive to local need. So upon delivering so many KPIs, people often ask me, and you might ask me, how do I evaluate my success or how do I evaluate fair game success? How do I know that we are walking the right way towards the challenge of reducing health inequality? Because I believe that health inequality is systematic, it's unfair, and it's preventable, and we see examples of this every day where I'm working. Well, we're now using innovative techniques to try and evaluate our success. So we've got these big cards, and we get the kids to point to emojis to how they're feeling at the end of every session. And we also look at behavioural interventions. So one example of, I think, where we've really been successful was when I was on trip in March, there was a young girl, and she kept pointing to the sad face emoji about how she's feeling after the session. And we asked her, why, why are you feeling this way? And she said, oh, my, you know, my uncle's just died, and he's, he's just died because you know, he was eating too much and he was smoking and drinking too much grog. And then every session we did, this girl was running around the oval two or three times and we're saying, well, why are you doing that? She goes, well, I'm doing this because I don't want to end up my, like, like my uncle. And for me, that's the impact. That's the behavioral change that we're trying to see long term to prevent these illnesses. Um, look, we also train remote teachers. We also train a host of diverse fair gamers. In the last 12 months, we've put five Aboriginal fair gamers through our training program, and that, that really makes me smile. Now, when I go back to Nullagine community, I see that kids' feet have got less foreign bodies. Um, there's fewer impetigo um, cases. And I also see the kids are playing boom ball, which is one of our really fun fair game games in their own time. And this stuff all makes me smile because it really, I think, works towards our vision for a fit and healthy Australia. And it's often said that culture trumps strategy in terms of organisations. And I really think that our tenacious, positive, solutions-focused mindset has been the foundation for success for Fair Game. And I'd like you to think and reflect yourself. If there's something that's keeping you up at night, um, an idea, then maybe it's time that as a junior doctor or as a medical student, you can help make this change. But you would be pleased to know that I no longer have that rock museum. Um, but I still do love living in the outback and one of my favourite memories happened only a couple of weeks ago in the car park of Coles in South Headland, which some of you might know well. And I was there and I saw on the back of this four-wheel drive two, two people waving at me and I went to see them and they're two kids I know quite well from a remote community about an hour's drive from Headland. And they were there and they had footy boots that Fair Game had donated to them. They had them on in the back of the car and they were driving twice a week the you know, hour and a half into town to attend footy training. And I just thought, you know, when we first started, they were about eight, like the kid kicking around the tin can, and now they're, you know, nearly 18 and they've made these changes. And for me, that really was the crystallization of us achieving our mission. There's a strong theme of mental health um, running through this convention based on the, the speakers and the plenaries. And everyone's probably much more qualified than I am on the topic. Um, but I think like, our identity as doctors really you know, is forged by entering the medical community, which you will do in a few years' time. However, within our lives, we're severely affected by the decisions we make. I think it's really important for us to recognise that we alone are in charge of these decisions and the situations that we put ourselves in. So my second message to you is that you can only control yourself. Has anyone ever heard of this before? Yes, yep. Yeah. So S plus T equals R. Let's, let's think about this for a little bit. It's essentially stimulus plus thought equals response or reaction. I'm the sort of person who's you know, very positive, who likes to lean in, who likes to nudge. But unfortunately, you know, you'll realise as doctors we can't control everything in our lives and we still 
a victim of circumstances that life puts us to. And I want to share some very private reflections with you in this space today that I hope might give you some clarity and understanding of this idea that you know, we're the only ones that can control the decisions we make. And it started on the 12th of April a few years ago. So it was my father's birthday lunch. Um, like many weddings, concerts, um, and all sorts of social events, as a doctor, I was unable to attend because I was working in the ED. And so I thought I, I thought my shift started at 12.30, so I was working at Perth in the ED, I rock up to my shift at 12.30 and I found that actually it started at two. And there was 90 minutes in which I maybe could have gone to that event. Um, look, the shift was a standard Sunday shift filled with DIY injuries, filled with sports injuries, and they had a, a, a middle-aged man who was at high risk of suicide, who was very depressed, so we admitted him to the hospital and we spent some time caring for him. And the next day, I was preparing to go to my next evening shift, and I got a call from my father, um, who was absolutely distraught, and he told me that my younger brother, Nick, had actually just committed suicide and, and had died. Um, and I fell back on the sofa, you know, I, I covered my face with my hands, I just, I couldn't believe this had happened to me, um, and this sort of patchwork of grief had begun to envelop me. And I would just say that the shock of an unexpected death cannot be um, overstated. Mental health really is something that is an equaliser across society. It doesn't matter where you come from, it can still affect you. Um, and it's a really terrible burden to have. And all you want to do when this happens is press pause, press rewind, um, you know, you lie awake at night feeling alone. But then blame and guilt are really common. And I still suffer from these. And I think, you know, I think Nick felt tormented by his intellect, um, his his creativity in the world around him. And I really, all I want to do is speak to him one more time. I want to assess his risk. I want to, as a doctor, as we do every day, I want to escalate his care. I want to understand that unspoken pain. You know, we do this for our patients and I was doing this for a patient on that same day that I couldn't make that lunch. And so I blamed myself, you know, I blamed my health service, um, but that really wasn't what's important here. A few days later, I had some more very unsettling news. One of my friends who was an aspiring surgeon had also died in tragic circumstances. And one of my other friends who I had worked with in the few days prior to leaving Australia had just appeared in, in an Islamic State propaganda film and I thought I'd never see him again. And I haven't. Um, but you know, the funny thing about being in a crisis like this is that the emails keep coming. You know, the messages keep coming, the tasks keep coming, and this eternal world that we create for ourselves really demands composure until it realises that the duck's feet under the water are just paddling over time, um, and then it gives compassion. But this compassion can fade quite quickly, it can fatigue, and a couple of years later, people don't really know what to ask, and people don't know when to ask, and even if it is appropriate to mention these things. The other important thing that I realised is it's important not to waste a crisis. So after these events, you know, we can't blame other people because really it's only ourselves and our decisions that we can control. And I've now spent a few years improving my relationships with friends and family um, because I realised that when you're a junior doctor, some of the professional decisions that we make, that you will make, can impact on your emotional relationships with other people. And it's really important for us to maintain the facets of, these facets of our life because everything can change for you in an instant and you need to make those decisions to carve the future that you want. Um, so please be settled with everything you're deciding um, because you're the one you know, that can choose your destiny. And if you have a dream, please, it's time to, to try and make that happen. I'd like to bring the conversation up a little bit now um, and talk about what we're good at. So people often ask me, you know, how do I choose the best training program? Um, where should I go after or for internship? And this can all be a very confusing part in a junior doctor's life. And if I had to give you one tip to have a successful and rewarding, impactful career in medicine, it would be this. It would be impact, uh, incubate your strengths at the periphery of your comfort zone. So let's, um, let's think about this for a, a little moment because it's quite hard to get your head around it. If I go back to my own personal example, obviously third year pathology was not something I was strong at. Um, so I wouldn't say in my new detail was something that was gonna be a career progression for me. And, and I, I sort of, I could have went from emergency medicine and finally settled into an Akram Rural Generalist training program, which I really enjoy. 
And when I was a first year registrar, I had a patient, let's call him Mark for, for interest's sake. And this is a very complex elderly patient who had leukemia, who had Parkinson's disease, and who had a host of other, other medical problems. And I knew that my strengths weren't gonna be you know, the management of Parkinson's disease, which we still really don't know the genetic etiology of. It was probably gonna more be the care, uh, liaising for the care for him, seeing the big picture issues, and being able to help him in, and his family cope in life. And so if you go back to this idea of incubating your strengths at the periphery of your comfort zone, we all know what we're good at, and we all know what is absolutely terrifying for us. And I'd like you to think about where the intersection for those two things might be. And I want you to grow yourself to the border, to the boundary of those two things. Have case discussions, look at TED Talks, read journal articles that will grow that boundary to meet the periphery and where your comfort zone and your terror zone lies. Because as a junior doctor, selecting the right career, I think, really relies a lot on this. You know, I don't have the veracity to be a surgeon, um, but for me, rural generalism really has provided a lot of very valuable lessons. And we need to train to be unconsciously competent at whatever we're doing. And I think the best way is to push these boundaries safely. If you can recognise this, maybe not today, but maybe in the next year or your final year of medical school, I think it will allow you to be comfortably challenged and it will allow you to answer the question in 10 years to say, look, if I met my five-year-old self, would that person be inspired by who I am? And then five years later, I actually got an email from Mark's daughter um, saying that he had passed away, but also thanking me for um, maintaining his incredible quality of life. And I think those are the rewards that we get from medicine, and that's why it's important to know your boundaries and then incubate your strengths at the periphery of your comfort zone. Okay, so the next uh, of my five lessons is called Wabi Sabi or Wabi Sabi. Um, Kanazawa is the capital city of a small Japanese prefecture called the Ishikawa Prefecture. And at the end of the Edo period, there was a huge castle created in this, in this town. There's some beautiful little heritage samurai villages. In a private art gallery a few years ago, I was introduced to this concept, and it really has changed my perspective on self-reflection. And I think it's quite a useful le lesson for us all to think about um, as you head towards being a junior doctor. Australia, and, and really the world, I think is obsessed with perfection. We have symmetry, ideal proportions, and our taste for beauty is shaped by mathematics um, and the quest for the perfect and the quest for the eternal. And I think, personally, I think we see this reflected in trends on social media um, today. I stumbled across a YouTube video that absolutely horrified me a couple of weeks ago, and it was of an Instagram influencer who spent 15 minutes talking about the nine or 10 apps and things that she does to every single photo to make them more commercially viable. So there was, you know, face um, shape changing, spot removal, object deletion, obviously the filters we all love. Um, and I really thought at that point, I was like, how can we be aspiring to this entirely edited photo? Uh, and then in the back streets of Kanazawa, this is what I found, and I found that the traditional Japanese aesthetic is extremely different, um, and it's encapsulated by that term wabi-sabi, for which we do not have a direct English language translation. And it essentially is the nurturing of all that is authentic by acknowledging the simple realities. So there are three things, that nothing lasts, nothing is finished, and that nothing is perfect. And this came about from 1488 in Kyoto, when a teacher was writing a letter to a student that, I've, that was famously known as the Letter of the Heart. And he was writing this letter because he was concerned about the direction the tea ceremony was heading. So the tea ceremony traditionally was to help monks stay awake during their long practices of self-reflection and meditation. And it had become a show pony exercise where warlords from China had brought these perfectly round teacups that were white porcelain without any cracks or errors. And they were looking at these beautiful teacups and gazing at, this, at the full moon and saying, yeah, isn't life great? And this teacher wrote a letter saying, I think we should start admiring the shadows and the intricacies of the half moon and the beautiful Japanese aesthetic. So what they started doing was creating teacups that actually had cracks in them purposefully. And then the, in this art gallery, which you can see a photo of, there were all these antiquities from this period, and they had these small deliberate errors that were glazed over and reglazed. And the Japanese aesthetic of desire started being wabi-sabi. And that term sabi was 
coined, which essentially was that beautiful crack that was re-mended um, over. And I think in terms of medicine, you're probably asking where's John going with this, I think in terms of medicine, I think we can ask for a bit of wabi-sabi in our lives. Look, there's ever-increasing pressures of assignments, um, the societal expectations, you know, we're expected by age 30 to sort of have it all together, um, the training requirements, and then recent learnings of the conviction of I'm not sure if you've read about the case of Dr. Bauagabra for manslaughter in the UK, have really muddy, muddied the water for journaling and this process of self-reflection. Um, on, I've just come off night shift, so on Monday's night shift in Headland, I had a patient with extreme flash pulmonary edema who was your know, peri-arrest, and she came in. And I spent a bit of time realising that, you know, I haven't done a perfect job. I've done the best I can. There was no adverse outcome, but maybe, you know, taking a little bit of dose of wabi-sabi, you know, maybe I could have started in airway interventions earlier. I could have applied GTN earlier. And I just think if we have in our lives, in our minds as junior doctors, this perfect porcelain Chinese tea mug, um, I don't think we're necessarily going to find impact and satisfaction. Um, and instead, maybe we look at the Japanese aesthetic and give ourselves opportunities for growth. Because we have 27 emotions every hour and we have 70,000 thoughts every day. And let's not set ourselves up for failure by thinking every single one of these can be like an ultra-filtered Instagram photo. Um, instead, let's think about it as being a beautiful piece of Japanese pottery which has clearly lasted the, the test of time. And the last lesson I'm going to talk about is this one. So it's Dare to Dream. Um, and I started thinking about this when I was a medical student. So here's me um, in a place called Tajikistan, which is a country sandwiched between Afghanistan and China. I did my elective there. And this was a hospital, the National TB Hospital. It was about 100 kilometres outside the main city of Dushanbe. And we drove out there and then I got to the hospital and I noticed that none of the staff really wanted to talk to the patients because as a TB patient in this country, you often are having a bit of a death sentence. So I went in and, you know, as you can see, barely any PPE um, and we were examining the patients, giving medications, etc. cetera. And um, this patient said, oh, can you take a photo of me? So I had, this is quite a long time ago, I had this little you know, digital camera at that stage and um, someone took a photo of us and I was driving back and then I looked and I noticed there was something odd about this photo. And if you look carefully, you can see that this guy's smiling. He's got a really big smile actually for his face. And I sort of thought, why, why is this person smiling? I mean, he's in negative 40 degrees in this cast iron bed in a hospital which you can see doesn't have huge resources with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which he may not um, ever get out of hospital for. So next day, went back um, and I asked him, you know, why are we smiling in that photo? And he said in broken Russian, something around, along the lines of, you know, I'm smiling because I've never had my photo taken with a camera like that before. And when I get out of hospital, I want to show my parents that photo and where I've come from. And I realised at that point that he had some big dreams in his life and he had not forgotten and had not given up on those dreams. And it made me realise that we are so lucky to have these dreams and this nurturing environment and you know, to have the two biggest problems in my life as a medical student, one of which was that I loved everything but studying and the second of which was that I was an extrovert. Um, and thinking about that privilege and, and where this person had come from and that really did spur me on at that stage to do things like fair game. So, let's bring this all together. Um, the guests you're going to hear from in the coming days, including the presenter next, who I know, look, have taken their medical careers in some absolutely incredible directions. Why did I choose to start Fair Game? Why did I, at such an early part of my career, um, make a bit of a departure from my peers and start making social impact? I think the answer lies in the stories I've told you um, and the lessons contained, those five lessons contained within them today. Look, I've become emotionally connected with the struggle of my patients in Headland. Um, on the death of my brother, I'm um, realising that as doctors we're not immune to adversity. By owning and taking control of my choices and then by incubating my strengths at the periphery of my comfort zone and selecting a training program being one that I want to do rather than one that I feel pressure to do. And then I think by acts of self-reflection and acknowledging like Japanese ceramics, <laughs> Nothing is perfect and most certainly not me. And then by smiling for every photo taken, no matter how dire the circumstances, um, I think these things have really given me meaning and reward and a part of my journey. 
And look, my journey may be less significant than that of Daisy Cadabies and her, you know, 1600 kilometer journey through the Rabbit Proof France narrative. But my journey, like yours, is equally important for the people that love you. So to, from today, I'd like you to please remember to learn and to laugh, especially at yourself, because you may make mistakes. Um, reflect on your strengths and don't be afraid to open up to those weaknesses. And I want you to ask yourself three questions if you can. So the first one is, you know, who am I? Like, you know, who really are you? Um, what motivates me? And am I taking this life? And am I grabbing it by the horns? And am I working towards and walking towards those issues that keep me up at night? Um, Walk towards these problems, see the world around you, um, and knowing that being a junior doc doesn't protect you from circumstance. Be connected to what you're doing because this is a wonderful career, and don't feel pressure to start doing something you're not emotionally connected with. And we've got, I'm just on time, so we've got about 10 minutes for questions, but before we do questions, I'm gonna read you a poem, which I really like. Um, it's a 1990s poem by Mary Oliver. You may have heard it before. And I'd like you to reflect on some of these words um, and carry them with you, and they might bring meaning, meaning to you. So you can just sit there and reflect, or you can close your eyes as I read this one to you. It's, it's quite famous. It's called The Summer Day or The Grasshopper. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper. I mean the one who's flung herself out of the grass, the one who's eating sugar out of my hand, the one who's moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who's gazing around with enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I do know how to pay to attention and I do know how to fall down into the grass and kneel down in the grass. How to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? So thanks so much for reflecting on those five lessons. Um, I think we've got some questions now. I think Jesse's going to come up or we'll take a seat and yeah, ask me anything you need. Guys, can we give John another huge round of applause? Thank you for ending on such a powerful note. It's a wonderful speech and those five messages were very relevant. Um, we've got some questions from the audience. The first one is, what sacrifices have you had to make to kind of realise the vision of Fair Game? Yeah, I think that second message probably talks a lot to that. So I think we make sacrifices every day. Um, and as I think I talked about, you know, being a junior doctor, especially on shifts, you, know, you kind of get used to missing out on, on social things. And for me, I realized at that point when my life went into a bit of a crisis that these are some sacrifices that I've made and that I think we do make as junior doctors. So that would be the biggest thing, I think, is that connection to family and, and probably connection to country as well. Mm. I think it, it's something that happens and it's a really hard tightrope to, to walk. Mm. Absolutely. So you um, mentioned some personal, um, sorry, personal stories. Um, how do you think we can improve mental health in medical students? Uh, in medical students, I think in medical students, the, the start of mental health is acknowledging the problem. Um, and the issue rather than the problem. It's not necessarily a problem for everybody. Um, and then I think the second thing for me is with good leadership, with good clinical leadership. I think if medical students have mentors and people who they aspire to who have acknowledged mental health and, and done certain tools, you know, the act belong commit messages to improve their own mental health, that's really important. And then the second thing I think is the idea and the culture we build within our clinical teaching of, you know, trying to eradicate bullying within medicine, especially towards medical students. I look back on some of the experiences that I had as a medical student and I kind of shudder and I think, now that I'm in that position, I would never say that to a student. Mm. Um, I remember being kicked out of, an, of a, uh, a theatre once 
um, and basically yelled out and humiliated for something and it was like my first week of fourth year. Mm. Um, so I think that is a big part of it, mm. is having a good culture from the whole medical community, um, acknowledging the problem and then looking at those tools that medical students can engage because I think it's really important to acknowledge it's an issue in medical school but then to recognise that the transition from medical student to junior doctor is actually not an easy one mm. and it's almost like if you're doing your first part physician exams you're expected to know all of that pathology, physiology, pharmacology and more from medical school whilst working on call and 40 hours a week so if we can't get it right now I think it's probably not a good yeah. Not so a good supporting people future. throughout their careers not just yeah. as medical students. Yeah. Fantastic. Do we have any audience questions? We've got a couple of roving mics going around. Just stick your hand up if you'd like a mic. Okay, so we've got one in the middle of the row there. <laughs> Fantastic. <Ooh. laughs> oh, late night last night. Um, <laughs> um, like I'm really interested in rural and remote medicine, um, but I get concerned sometimes about like social isolation from like being away from family and friends, and like in those really remote communities where you. Yeah, there's not a lot of people around. Um, how, how have you found working in those kind of remote areas and like, keep like maintaining social relationships yeah. with people back home and all that? That's, yeah, that's the million dollar question. So it's really good that you brought this up. Um, so within our town of Port Hedland, and you know, I'm gonna be very positive about our job because we all love where we work. We get so much reward. And all of us say, geez, I couldn't do this job in the city. I couldn't get to see the diversity of what we're doing. And I also work here in Perth in a tertiary hospital and in a large secondary hospital. And I certainly find the rewards of working in the city, and I do work in um, New South Wales a little bit as well, I find the rewards of being in the city just aren't as great as in a rural area. The big problem or the big issue is the ability to have that work-life balance and the ability to have a future and maintain those connections. So my hint would be, and my top tip would be, and some of the med students here who see me in Headland know that I do this, I'm, once a month I try to maintain coming back to Perth or going on holiday or going somewhere and having those social experiences because you really need to invest in yourself and whilst it costs you know a lot of money, the flights are expensive, it actually is just worth it for your mental health and your longevity. So I say once a month give yourself mental health space, give yourself um, time off and try to find or be part of change in a rural hospital that allows flexible rostering. I think flexible rostering is the key. Uh, difference I see between our medical staff and our nursing staff at our area health services that we offer flexibility for a lot of our doctors in regional and rural areas much more than the city because we acknowledge that retention is so much more important than burning people out um, and people missing out on every wedding. Um, we get an extra week of Northwest leave here in this state which is great so you get an extra week of leave per year. We also get um, and Jeff can talk about this later as well but yeah FACRAMs or rural um, GPs get a certain amount of upskilling too so say you want to do anaesthetics you actually get an extra 10 days of upskilling which you can come back to the city and maintain those friendships but the key is trying to have your pie graph and trying to have enough social personal time alongside everything else and rural areas in Australia are getting better and better and I think the lifestyle choices in especially in Queensland are phenomenal like some of the rural areas in Queensland I'm just jealous because <laughs> there's so, much, so many cool things to do in these towns um, in WA we've still got a bit more um, a bit more of an authentic experience um, <laughs> But you know, bowls clubs and uh, other exciting things can bring a bit of light to your life too. <laughs> Do you have any more audience questions? Okay, so there's a question through the app. Yeah. Um, have you struggled with language barriers in rural areas? Yes, we have. Um, funnily enough, one of the language barriers we struggle with is not necessarily the Aboriginal languages. Uh, there are often in, in our area, there are a lot of people who come from the Philippines or who come from other um, like Macedonia and areas and we struggle with language barriers because often there's only their family to translate and then it's really hard to get a, obviously an interpreter, you can get the on, on the phone interpreters. But with Aboriginal people we also struggle with language barrier and I think it's kind of a combination of both language and culture. Um, so one of the things, a lesson that I learned is I once asked someone to get an x-ray. So I gave them a form and said yeah, you've, you might have a broken hand, can you get an x-ray? And then I got really upset that the next time I saw that patient out near Coles, I was like, you haven't had your x-ray yet. You haven't come back. You've, got, you've still got your broken hand. And what I needed to say was, have your x-ray today. 
because having x-ray is very open-ended and with a language barrier and the idea, especially with some of our Aboriginal cultures, that it's not future focused, it's not you know, oriented in time, it's oriented in place and person, that that person thought, oh yeah, the doctor said get an x-ray, I might get that next year or I might get that next week. And I think that intersection of language and culture is really important. And then I think also changing the way in which you speak to really understand your patients is important. I, I always ask people two things. So the first thing is, you know, how can I help you? Because there's often a disconnect. People might start telling you a story but not realise the reason why they're there is for X, Y, Z. And the second thing is, you know, do you, do you understand or does this make sense? Mm. And I think having that authentic questioning will help you. And if you don't, um, if you don't quite get through to that person, get another opinion because mm. sometimes language is, is interesting and there might be also gender issues as well. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so Fair Game is obviously a fantastic cause. How can people in the audience get involved in it? Oh, yeah. Well, there's plenty of opportunities, actually. We've got a training on the 29th of July here in Perth. We've got 25 spots for that. And um, basically, you can send myself an email or our um, CEO an email. So it's just john, J-O-H-N, at fairgame.org.au. And we'll reach out to me in social media. And we are aiming to really grow the capacity of the organisation over the next few years. And I think med students are kind of the key to that, especially interstate. Wouldn't it be great if we could set up a hub in you know, Melbourne as well or set up a hub in Queensland too and med students could potentially, or med socks could potentially own that like, like kind of what's happening in Armidale. Um, this could be a great model of um, doing some sort of community health education and cultural awareness. But then it means you can also come to road trips in WA too, which is super fun. Can we have another audience question? Up there. Um, hey John, thanks for your talk. My question was, how have you found balancing your medical career with the social, entre social like entrepreneurship that Fair Game obviously would like, obviously would have been a very challenging process to create a startup to do all these things? Yeah, that that is a really difficult question um, because it is very hard. I, I won't lie and say it's been easy. Um, you know, there are times it's been really, really hard, especially around that time, you know, I was having a lot of stuff going in, on in my life. Like it's, it's very easy to feel, especially with a startup, the first emotion you, th you feel is you know, um, exhilaration. And the second thing you start to feel is um, exhaustion. And then the third thing you start to feel is uh, exasperation. And you start to kind of ask a question and say, what am I doing? You know, am I doing the right thing? Jeez, we should just stop this whole thing. There's been about 20 times where I've thought, oh my gosh, we need to stop this whole thing. It's gone out of control. You know, we're not helping. Um, I'm just spending all my time doing this. I'm going to fail my ED exams. Um, and yeah, it's a hard one. So I think I've kind of drawn on a couple of concepts that I value a lot. And the first one is presence. I think it's really important to be present with where you are and especially with you know, push notifications, social media, it's becoming increasingly difficult to be present in where you are at that point in time. So either through you know, meditation, fitness, which is something I hold really true and dear to me, um, or reflection, being present in the moment will give you so much more time. If you turn off push notifications on your phone or turn it to flight mode because you have to do something, an assignment or exam prep, you'll find you actually do it. Um, so for me, it's been that dedicated allocation of time. The flip side of that, and I kind of drew into that in my speech, was that I didn't have that downtime and I didn't have that um, innate time to just have the experiences with my, with my family and friends. And I think that's when I reached that kind of crisis point. So a lot of my other colleagues have done startups both in um, medical industries and in other areas. And I think we all go through that startup journey, found a problem, and it's really challenging. So yeah. You know, you've got your pie and you want to try and allocate enough in there and be really good at using calendars, I think. John, thank you so much for talking to us, especially after a night shift. He's come all the way down from Port Hedley. Can you please give him a huge round of applause? Thanks.